Hello, welcome all to Codom X. Today we are going live within the 42 network. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you all for watching online. Those for you not familiar with Codom X, it is a weekly talk given at Codom about anything in or surrounding technology. If you have any questions during the talk, please keep them till the end and make sure to turn off your phone. After uh, the talk, we will also have the opportunity to get some drinks at Canteen. The first round is on us and Dave will pass out some tickets. Great, thanks Lorena. So today we have uh, two speakers from DOT uh, with us. DOT is a shared mobility company that actually started in Amsterdam in 2018. So they provide shared uh, electric scooters and bikes across European cities. And it's our great honor to have Maxime, the co-founder of DOT, and also Philippe, the head of engineering uh, with us in the house today. So they are going to talk to us about how DOT is tackling the urban mobility challenge and also from a software engineering point of view, how to scale the business fast and efficiently. So let's give a warm welcome and applause uh, to our speakers today. Hi guys. Uh and hi guys, uh, whoever you are in the world uh, watching us, uh, I'm very proud uh, to be here for the first uh, Kodam X uh, streamline uh, in the multiple uh, campuses of Kodam. Uh, I discovered actually uh, Kodam for the first time about uh, one month ago uh, with David. Uh, and I have to say I was very impressed. I was very impressed to find uh, students that are, you know, you guys and are very, autonomous, very mature, very entrepreneurial. And I thought, okay, I, when I discussed with Philippe, uh, uh, who had the engineering, I said, okay, we have to come back. Uh, we have to hire some people here. <laughs> These guys are entrepreneurial uh, like us. So uh, this is a perfect match and, and we should really do something together. So that's why I'm back here today, one month after uh, my first visit. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we will be interested by uh, what we guys at DOT uh, are doing uh, the challenge or the problems we are aiming to solve, uh, the way we are solving it, and obviously uh, more in detail, uh, Philippe will explain how we are setting up uh, software engineering uh, to scale uh, you know, from a, a very small company. I mean, we started only 18 months ago. We are just a few people with Philippe uh, to hopefully uh, something that will be uh, really big uh, in the future. So let's start with what we are solving for. Um, Today, in cities, especially in big cities, think about Paris, think about London, think about New York, people are overall unhappy about transportation or mobility. Why? Because it's a pain. You know, what are the choices or the main choices that people have? Either they use their cars and they spend most of their time stuck in traffic jams, or they use public transportation, and here, you know, it's a picture taken in Paris, and, you know, we all know that the public transportation in big cities usually is uh, overly saturated, so, you know, you get cramped uh, into uh, uh, metro uh, coaches, in subway, in buses, people hate it, and they spend a lot of time, you know, in uh, doing transportation, which is obviously time where most of the time they're frustrated instead of enjoying uh, the city uh, being outside. The second problem is obviously we have a small problem right now worldwide, uh, which is called global warming. And uh, all cities know, and, and you guys know, uh, that we have to, uh, to reduce massively uh, carbon emissions. And obviously today, uh, cities produce a lot of carbon uh, emissions because of the cars, because of bus, and uh, the general activity, uh, uh, the human uh, activity, but especially transportation. The air also uh, is polluted. Uh, you know, uh, people uh, get diseased because of that. Uh, and the cars and in general mobility creates a lot of noise, which is also a problem for, for people. So this needs to be changed. And we see it starts probably by uh, reducing uh, fuel-based uh, vehicles in cities. The third uh, kind of change that is happening is, you know, if you talk uh, or if you think about the 60s, uh, you know, like the, the, the big achievement uh, was to become a car owner. You know, you, 
you start to work, the first thing you wanted to do even before having a house is buying your car and then you are somebody. Uh, and, and Philippe actually still uh, is, is a, the proud <laughs> car owner, but I'm working hard to, to change his mind. It's, it's, it's taking some time, but uh, he will get there. Uh, and today, you know, with you guys and the young generation, including myself, even if I'm not as young, uh, you know, I think we, we are changing our mind. We don't want to be car owners necessarily. What we want is flexibility. We don't want to bother maintaining a car. We want to be able uh, today uh, to use a bike, uh, tomorrow uh, maybe to use a car because we need to go to in the countryside, or another day we want to use the train. And basically, we want to use mobility as a service. We don't want uh, to have our own vehicle. It doesn't make any sense uh, either economically or uh, in terms of time you spend on it. So we want to be free and, and use mobility as a service. So these are kind of the three kind of shifts and, and problems that are happening today in mobility in cities. And this is obviously where we come in with DOT and, and we want to offer a solution. So first, what do you, we believe in? We believe that cities will see a massive transformation in mobility in the 10 next years. What will change? The first thing is, you know, you go outside in Amsterdam or wherever you guys are watching are in Paris or Los Angeles or wherever. You go outside, the first thing you see in the street is obviously car and fuel-based cars. I am convinced that in 10 years' time, you won't see that. You know, you, you might still see cars, electric cars, electric cars maybe. But generally speaking, fuel-based cars, except maybe for Philip, like that wants to create a museum of what the, the, the whole world, they won't be there. Because just it's not possible, you know, like global warming, pollution, like all cities, progressively, they want to ban cars. And it's going to be completely different. Public transportation, it's already a bit the case in, in most cities, but it will be even more uh, the fact that this will be the main way for macro transit, so uh, long distance trips. This is already the case, but I think the, the main thing is that the second part, which, or the third part, sorry, which is for short distance trips, right now, it's still mainly a public transportation or cars in most cities, except obviously a few exceptions like Amsterdam. But you take the case of uh, uh, Paris or London, it's just four or five percent of people that use bikes or any, uh, you know, other forms of micromobility. That's going to change because for all short distance trips, we believe that bikes, e-bikes, e-scooters, are going to be the most convenient, the most joyful, the cheapest way, the most healthy also way uh, to go around. And that will replace, from a space perspective, a lot the, the, the space that the cars are using today. Mobility will be more and more a service. People won't own their cars. Instead, they will be using multiple types of services that will be shared and uh, on a short-term lease. Micro and macro transit will be integrated. What does it mean? It means that we believe that it will become progressively a seamless experience where if you get out of public, let's say you use your OV card in Amsterdam uh, to use public transportation, you use the tram, you will get out a little bit like it's already the case, but if you want to use an e-scooter, an e-bike or whatever, you will use the same OV card and be able to move for your shorter distance trip. So we think that overall, Mobility, obviously, will be a lot greener. There will be a lot more micro-mobility. It will be a lot more seamless. And hopefully also, because people are around in the streets, it will be also a much more joyful and less stressful experience as it is today. So we focus, obviously, at DOT on one aspect of it, which is mobility or shared micro-mobility. So what we do, our mission, is to make green mobility the easy choice for people in European cities. What we want is to offer a service, a micro-mobility service, that is so easy to use that people might have been using before other you know, cars, taxis, or whatever, and suddenly we offer to them an e-bike, an e-scooter. It's very easy to use, it's very cheap, and so they don't want to use anything anymore. And so how do we do that? So obviously the first step, and that's where we are today, is to offer shared e-scooters. 
So today, here it's, a, it's an example in Paris. So for instance, uh, you know, I was uh, staying there to, to meet some friends, and then I, I had to go to uh, the Centre Pompidou uh, to, 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 uh, to, the, to our office. And the choices that I have are the following. Either I use my own car if I have one. It takes about 40 minutes. And it will be a pure pain because there will be traffic jams. I have to park it. And plus, it's expensive to have a car. I could use a taxi. The taxi is expensive. It takes about the same time, 40 minutes. I could use, uh, potentially, the bus. But again, I have to go to a bus station, wait. And then again, it's about 40 minutes. And then I don't arrive exactly where I want. But it's cheap. It's very cheap. It's just uh, you know, 2.8 euro. I could use the metro, but the same. I have to get inside. Uh, uh, maybe it's not, uh, you know, especially in terms of uh, time of coronavirus, it's maybe not that clean. Uh, and the same, I have to wait for the metro. Maybe it's late. Then I'm packed with a lot of people. Then I get out, not exactly where I want, and then I will have to walk. If I walk, it takes about one hour, but it costs me zero. <laughs> and, so, and then, obviously, at DART, we offer e-scooters, shared e-scooters. So why do people use them? Because it's very easy. You, you go out, you take your app, you scan the QR code on the e-scooter, you climb on it, you probably drive much quicker, maybe 15 minutes, because you're on cycling lanes, you don't have to, to deal with the traffic jams. You're outside, so you can see the life outside. It's cheap. It's about the price of a metro ticket, so 2.8 euro. And hopefully, because it's, uh, it's an e-scooter, you, you surf on it, and uh, you have a bit of fun. So that's why, you know, some people sometimes ask, why are people using e-scooters? It seems to, you know, what is this story? But that's why, you know, because rationally for people, it makes sense to use it. It's cheaper, it's quicker, and uh, they, they find it a lot more joyful. And the great thing is that it's overall uh, carbon-free, it's, uh, it's green, and, and so it participates to the building of uh, this, this, world, this world where you, know, you have only uh, micro, uh, micro mobility and, and public transportation uh, as a mobility service. So that's today. And tomorrow, we plan, uh, uh, we want to offer different types of vehicles for different types of people. Uh, not everyone wants to use e-scooters, so we are going to also uh, uh, use, uh, uh, offer e-bikes, uh, and then probably mechanical bikes. And then overall, uh, we are working to integrate our service with public transportation and also integrate other types of service. It could be shared cars, so that if people use what we call the dot city pass, they can use any types of mobility service in uh, their city. So it's, it creates a seamless experience. It's a big market from a business perspective. Uh, all cities want to move uh, to zero carbon emission. All cities want more micromobility, and therefore, uh, you know, Europe, we consider, is, is the first market uh, for the next years in that. And, uh, and obviously, we, we hope to be uh, one of the leaders in, in that field. What makes us special uh, as a business, the first thing, and, and obviously, uh, Philip will talk more about it, uh, the part that you are really interested. So we develop everything in-house. All the software is developed in-house. So for our operations, for fleet management, for the riders, so we completely master the user experience. And we did it from day one, which took us a bit more time than some of our competitors. But now, you know, we control everything. The hardware and the IoT piece, it's the same. We develop it in-house, which enables us to create more uh, safer uh, types of vehicles. And uh, also, obviously, uh, uh, have a lot more control uh, on our hardware and make it more durable so that you know, we don't create waste with it. Second big specificity is that we do also, uh, we're a bit, uh, I think, maniac, but we like to control things. So we also do all our operations in-house. We don't believe in outsourcing that. We want to do all the maintenance. So our mechanics are part of our team. They're also shareholders of that. Uh, the people doing the recharging operation are part of our team. The people on the cargo e-bike uh, to, you know, checking for the vehicles are part of our team. And so we have a very tight control on our operation in the cities, which means also that we can ensure that the maintenance of our vehicles is very well done, that they last, and obviously that the experience and availability is always at the best in the cities where we operate. Our goal is really to create this operational model that we can replicate in every city and is extremely efficient. Three, obviously the most important uh, side product is the team. Uh, we have a very strong culture, like in Kodam, where you have also uh, 
a strong culture, you know, I can see that. I see a lot of you also having, uh, by the way, the Kodam shirt. Uh, we have also our, our dot shirt. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I think if people in the end want to join us, it's, it's not because uh, we are building the best product or whatever. It's because they believe in what we do and the way we work as a team. And we have four values which are transparent, environmental conscious, so we want people that really care about the impact of what they do in cities. Uh, getting things done, so we, you know, we are a startup, we need to get, uh, not shit, but things done. Uh, and, and be extremely action-oriented, so if you join us, obviously, you, know, you, you won't be just, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, so looking at what uh, some engineer is doing, you will do you know, real things. And uh, we are a family, meaning that we really believe in helping each other uh, to succeed. All employees are shareholders. From uh, you know, mechanics, everyone is a shareholder, so everyone owns a piece of the company. And we really don't believe in titles, so we don't have VPs, we don't have directors, we have only people that are responsible for something, own a part of the business. Today, a dot, uh, after one year, so where are we? Uh, and I will, uh, I'm almost done on my side. Uh, so first, uh, within 12 months, we raised 50 million euros, uh, so from top, uh, uh, level investors, so especially NASPERS, EQT, it's a, it's a very capex intensive game because you need to buy vehicles uh, before you put them in the streets. So it's, it's important to have strong investors and, and these are you know, uh, VCs that are able to follow us also on the next round. Uh, in terms of uh, operations, so we are after 12 months already in uh, about 10 cities. Uh, and in a lot of the cities where we started, we are, generally speaking, already number one or two in what we do. Uh, we scale very fast, so we're already doing 500,000 rides a day, and we believe that with the ramp up currently, we'll be very soon at one million rides a day. So it's not like, you know, we are imagining a market. There is a market, and we did not spend anything on marketing, so the need is there. People, you put these scooters, you put e-bikes, they use them because it's a service for them. And we have about 180 uh, guys working for us, about 40 in software engineering, which is a piece that you are interested in, building everything from scratch. Uh, hardware, these are the people developing the vehicles. Ops, obviously, we need a lot more people uh, to do all the operation in cities. And then other, I'm part of other. <laughs> so that, we don't know exactly what these guys are doing, but they do, I guess, <laughs> presentation in Kodam or things like that. Uh, and the headquarters is in Amsterdam, uh, so that's where we develop uh, all the products. So that's a bit, uh, I wanted to explain you a bit what we are, why, uh, you know, what problem we are solving. It's very exciting. Uh, mobility uh, is, uh, you know, it will be completely transformed in the 10 next years, and uh, we are part of it. We want uh, uh, the, the cities and mobility to change. So now I pass it to <coughs> Philip, we'll talk about uh, the software engineering side. There are a couple of topics that I want to talk about, um, but first a small introduction. So hi everyone, I'm Philip. Thank you for bearing with us on this presentation. Um, I'm head of engineering at DOT and pretty much my responsibility is to ensure that we have a clear vision and that everyone is being able to execute on that vision in a time efficient uh, and a consistent manner. Um, for the past 12 years, I've spent pretty much all my life in startups. Uh, with Uber being the last five years. So I've seen startups come and go. I've seen hyperscale and hyper growth. And uh, the things that I want to talk about today is some of the learnings that I've seen in these companies and what enabled us to set up an engineering site for scale. As Maxim already explained, this is a very interesting market uh, with tremendous growth capabilities. So you need to think about engineering products from day one that will be able to you know, facilitate that kind of growth. So the first thing is when you start building a team, you really need to think about what, what does matter? What is the most essential thing that you want to care about? And that is to validate your product. You need to understand if there is a market fit for your product. It's very easy to jump into you know, code and, and building screens and backend services and then by the time you're done, like no one wants to use it. And the two main reasons why companies fail is either whatever you build, there is no interest for in the market, 
or you overspend on your resources. You, know, you, you get funded, and then you just spend it all on building beautiful things that no one want to use. Um, so you have to be cautious about this. So validating your business case, validating your product is essence number one. Um, and you do that through iteration. You build something, you put it out on the market, you test it, you, you learn from it, and you adjust. That, that is how you grow. So that was the foundation for us when we start building a team. As you invest your resources, as you grow as a team, um, you work together with, uh, with hiring, uh, with recruiters, you, you build out a solid foundation. You need to focus on user experience. And whether that's software or hardware, the users are your first interaction point. And that is where you'll get the feedback. And it's essential that the first interaction is good. Because otherwise, you'll just you know, go to any of the competitors. Um, obviously, there are also other factors and you know, things like density, availability of your vehicles. But typically, the first thing you do is you, know, you see something on the street, you download the app, you look at it, and it has to be a pleasant thing to use. So it has to be fast. It has to be performance. Um, it has to do exactly what you ask it to do. You know, no complexities. So this is why we um, invested in doing everything in-house, uh, having designers work with us, build a product, and, and iterate through that. Um, this is what you don't want to do on your day one. You, know, you don't want to be setting up servers uh, and managing infrastructure and building out a DevOps team. That will come later. As you've validated your product and validated your business case, there will be time to start optimizing and seeing where are we spending our money. Right? Where are we spending our resources? How can we do that better? And typically, you first start by looking around and taking whatever is available on the market and then kind of working through it, understanding your needs, and then saying, okay, we can do a better job at this. We can take it in-house and we can build it ourselves. And infrastructure is definitely one of those things that you have to think about, well, maybe we can outsource that. Um, if we think about building a product like dot for example, a, any consumer product, from scratch, there are a million things that, that you need to think about, right? Uh, you need to think about security. You, you need to think about authentication. Um, you need to think about how, how are we going to deploy all of this? Um, stuff like CI, CD, um, load balancing and traffic. And before you know it, like there are a million more things before you know it, there's no more time to actually develop your product because all your resources are going into thinking about this. Um, this is one from day one, we started thinking about lean infrastructure, right? Uh, piggybacking on, on, on some of these companies that are already out there that are not core to our business. Um, thinking about infrastructure as a service. Thinking about how will it scale? Do we have to worry about this or can we let someone else worry about this? Um, and the good thing is security and availability come, comes by design from a lot of these companies. And even if you're a startup, you have to think about security of your users and compliance with GDPR. Um, it is not something, uh, as Henry, our co-founder, likes to call a Friday 4 p.m. thing. Um, it, it needs to be rooted in, in, in your culture. So there are plenty of these partners, uh, and they all pretty much have the same product. Um, there are some differences, perhaps naming, documentation, SDKs, but in terms of your needs, any of them is fine. Um, if you want to run Kubernetes, you, know, you want to deploy some things, it's fine. You can do it on Google Kubernetes, or you can do it on the Elastic Compute or, or Azure. Um, if you want to have a real-time database, that's also fine. Google offers Cloud Firestore. Um, Amazon offers uh, DynamoDB or, or table storage. Um, it's, it doesn't really matter which one you pick, or does it? Because you need to understand that making this choice, it's, it's a tight partnership that you're going to build with this company. You are dependent on them because although it's not core to your business, your entire business is functioning on this. So if there is an outage, Suddenly, you're dependent on this partner, 
And then it becomes a question mark. It's like, hey, guys, uh, we have an outage here. Who are we going to call? Right? Are you going to file a support task with uh, the Amazon team saying, like, our business stopped running. Can you please fix it? Um, so it, it is very essential that you understand that you have this dependency and that it's all about building a partnership with uh, whoever you choose. And you have to understand what, what, what is your roadmap? Where are you guys going to? Like, how will, will, will we be able to leverage your roadmap uh, on the long term? And as you build this partnership, you have to continuously provide feedback on the products that you use. Because that is where the partners learn. Right? They will learn, they will improve, they'll iterate on it. Um, and therefore, the product and your service eventually and your availability will become better. It also enables you, if you continuously provide this feedback, it also enables you to gain early access because they see that you're definitely interested and you're willing to provide feedback on the products that you're using. So they'll most likely be interested in giving you access to early uh, alpha programs, um, which is a very interesting thing because it can provide you with competitive advantage. Things that are new on the market, you know, no one else is doing, it might... You know, increase your performance or, or provide you with tooling that no one else has, um, for example, for operations. Do be, be careful with the last one, although it is super interesting to jump on new technology. And as, as all of you engineers, you know, that's the thing that drives us. We, we are curious by nature. We want to build things. We want to experiment. Um, be careful with this aspect because you're you'll be working with things that are not production ready, that are continuously changing. Now, they, they, they don't have a thing um, like stable releases. Anything can break at any time. So if you go into early access programs, do think about how is this going to impact my production or ability to support this tool. One more thing on this part is do think about hiring. Now, Taking on this partnership, you also need to think, what are the people that we can bring in? Um, and always look out for people that are eager to work with new technologies, that, that embrace new technologies, that want to be challenged, um, and that are definitely not afraid of something that's new. You want to look for people that are willing to learn. Uh, and I think we at least think we are at the right spot at Codem to, to find people that are willing to learn. Um, so once you've kind of established that, okay, what's important for us? Um, what do we want to build as a team? Where do we want to invest in-house and what can we outsource? It's important to understand, although you have cultural values on a company level, you also need to have some form of rules on, on an engineering level. And this is basically what's called playing a game, right? There is a goal. Everyone on the team is joined in. There is one clear goal, and in our case, it's the ability to move fast. How do we ensure that everyone on the team can move fast? Uh, and in order to play that game, we need to have a set of rules that everyone understands and can follow. And this is where we start with engineering principles. Rule number one is it's always about communication. This is highly important. Talk as much as possible before you jump into code. I know that we always want to jump into code first. It's sometimes even easier explaining things into code, but being able to explain things face to face or on a white wall will make you a better engineer, will, make you, will give you the ability to stand back and listen to what others are saying instead of focusing on developing something that you do. Um, this is why we take um, uh, this step very seriously. We, we have a process which is called RFC, um, which is request for comment. And it's a valid process for both product and engineering, where product starts off with drafting a document, answering why. Why are we even talking about this feature? Providing examples and data, backing it up, and finishing off with, this is how we're going to measure success of this feature and then asking for input from the engineering team. And then Eng team will take that same process, same document, and will work on engineering criteria. And eventually we'll share it with all of the engineering team and ask for feedback. 
because this is where the discussion happens instead of in a pull request. So communication is, is essential, so no, essential on our part. Um, second one is try to keep things simple. <laughs> it is um, very easy and surprisingly easy to overcomplicate things. You know, think about clean code. Think, uh, think about simple functions uh, or, or classes. Um, think about naming convention. But try to keep things simple, which makes it easy to explain to other people. And if you have a tight group of people, you kind of figure it out how everyone wants to work. But as you onboard new people or an intern comes in, he needs to understand the code just as easy as you do, pretty much on the first day. If he doesn't, it's a steep learning curve and you'll struggle. Second, uh, the third one, um, try to build for purpose. You know, you have something that you want to get resolved as a problem or as a product. Um, and make sure that you just build for that. If you're working on a class, you know, it should be easily testable. It should only do one thing, and, and that's it. You want to build one of these things. What you don't want to build is this. Right? And this is where you can end up really fast because you're thinking, you know, I have this beautiful class and I'm just going to abstract it away so that it can take more parameters and it will be able to do everything that I want. And then you end up not using it and having no idea how to maintain it. And then you just go like, you know what, I'm just going to scrap it and just start it over again. Last one is done is better than perfect. Um, you have to iterate. Iteration is the only way that will give you speed eventually. If you want to do things perfect, and, and done is better than perfect, doesn't say that you want to do something fast and sloppy. Uh, you still have to think about the impact of the thing that you're doing. But you have to measure it. You have to understand it. You have to make the right choices along the way. So focus on getting things out there first, measure it, learn from it, adjust, and then put it back in production instead of working in Waterfall for one year and then delivering a project and you know, by the time no one wants to use it anymore. Um, so these are some of the engineering principles that we have in, in our team and that are part of the foundation. And everyone joining new the company understands them. Um, however, you have to continuously work on them. You have to make sure everyone adheres to them. Because it's easy to you know, lose yourself in all of the work and all of the feature developments because of high speed. Uh, a bit more about our... How did I do that? <laughs> and support, let's press a button, see what happens. No, that's definitely a wrong button. Uh, audience Q&A, hell no. Hi, thank you for fixing it. See, Maxime, <laughs> amazing. Everyone, everyone does engineering. Um, so a bit more about our stack. Um, and, and then I want to finish off with a clear example of, of, of one of the tech talent challenges that we have. Um, so we chose to go with Google um, as our partner. Why? Because Amazon has definitely been out there way longer than Google is. They have uh, tons of things and, oh, sorry. Um, they have tons of products. Uh, you can go on Stack Overflow and pretty much find any answer to any problem you will ever encounter. However, that's also the issue. The documentation is often outdated. The products are legacy and complex. And if you want to file a support task with uh, Amazon to improve something, tough luck. Um, Azure. If you, Microsoft will definitely support and listen to you if you have a setup of above a million. So not really our thing. Um, Google, on the other hand, they are very eager to learn. They are continuously seeking for feedback and they really invest in the smaller guys to work with them. So they know that that's a, again, through iteration, it will be much faster. So we went with Google and um, we, we used tons of their products. Uh, we use uh, Cloud Functions, 
to ensure that we don't have to manage services, we don't have to manage microservices, we have a single responsibility approach. So our entire system is event-driven. We have about 400 standalone functions that are all connected through, um, uh, through PubSub mechanism. So everything is uh, reactive in our system. Uh, we use uh, Cloud Firestore as our real-time uh, database layer. Uh, why? Because it seamlessly integrates with a client. And unblocking the clients, so the writer application or the ops application, they can build their own product because they're directly communicating to the real-time Firestore. Um, as well as BigQuery. Uh, any of our data analysts is done on, on the BigQuery level. Uh, on the mobile side of things, we use native uh, iOS and, and Android, uh, Swift and Kotlin. Um, why? Because it provides the best user experience. We want to ensure that we control that user experience. Uh, and we build a team around that. So we use MVVM as our architecture, and we try to keep it in sync on both of them. And this is where communication, again, comes into play, where an engineering team discussing a feature, there will be both iOS and Android team present during the technical discussion, thinking about architecture and trying to keep it in sync. In sync. We also think about, uh, and this is more on the platform side of things, um, we want to make sure that we have solid monitoring and alerting. As we put things in production, as we move fast, um, I am not a strong believer of having staging environments and Q&A teams. I believe it should be the responsibility of an engineer to really think about what he puts in production eventually. Because if your goal is just to build something and then throw it over to the Q&A team and think, well, they'll fix it, they'll find the bug, that's the wrong mindset. So we really invest in monitoring and alerting. And we invest in the ability to mitigate issues in production. There will always be issues, no matter how good your CI CD is set up or QA team has done their testing. By the time that you put it in production, especially on mobile devices like iOS and Android, well, maybe Android a bit less, but iOS, good luck. You'll be waiting three days before they update your app. Right? If you have a problem, what are you going to do? You need to think about mitigating issues in production, A-B testing, feature flags, those kind of things. That is what, what, the thing that will give you speed and confidence. And confidence is the, the, the key word here. Because as an engineer, there are two things that you want to do. You want to be happy and you want to sleep well. <laughs> that's it. And that's what we really try for. <laughs> So those were some of the kind of engineering principles and things that we really care about. Now, I want to talk a bit more about a tech challenge. And I, I just picked one. Um, and this is going to be about imagining product experience where you open up an application and you want to find a vehicle you know, near you that, that you want to use. Um, you want that experience to be smooth and, and seamless and fast. Um, and the UI should not be cluttered. So thinking about searching for that vehicle as you pan along, like what are some of the complexities behind this you know, simple user experience? I mean, even looking at the screen, how hard can it be, right? Um, someone could take an approach where you'll have a bounding box, right? A bounding box is a set of uh, latitude, longitude coordinates that you then send off to a server saying, hey, you know what? I'm in this area. Give me vehicles. And a response would look something like this. You know, here are a bunch of vehicles. This is their location. This is their price. This is the battery level. Um, enjoy. And then you just plot it on the screen. Now, there, there are a couple of problems with this approach if you're thinking about scale. Um, one of them, the data is stale. So even from user experience, you, by the time that you get to the scooter, you don't know if it's still available or not. Someone else might have already booked it. Um, it is very resource heavy. The fact that there is a request going to the server for a specific bounding box, the more users you get, your servers will be bombarded and you have to continuously keep on scaling your services. The funny thing is, this specific uh, provider actually implemented this little button here. 
Now that button is a manual refresh button. As you move to a different region, you have to press that button in order to save performance of their servers. So you're altering user experience. Uh, this is not what you want to do. Um, so how does this actually scale? I'm pressing the wrong button again. There we go. Um, to answer your question, let me take you one step deeper. Um, thinking about f doing a fetch request on a bounding box, it means that you have to query in a two-dimensional space. You're querying for latitude and longitude. So if you think that, how would then I set up a database that would fa be fast and optimized for this kind of things, um, it's very complex because you cannot use default uh, table indexing on this. You have to think about geo-orientated data storages such as Postgres. However, Postgres then brings additional challenges because you're talking about an SQL system which is hard to shard. So now you're digging deeper into the rabbit hole. Um, and this is where we took a different approach. Because we're already using Cloud, uh, Cloud Firestore uh, as our main data storage, we decided to go with geohashes. And uh, for those who do not know, geohash is a representation of any area on the world. And the longer the decimal number, it's a binary number, so the longer the decimal number, the higher the accuracy, or sorry, the, the smaller the region is that you're requesting for. And you can go as low as a single point, but theoretically it would always be a region. A region. So the reason why we chose for geohashing is because we already use Cloud Firestore uh, as our system, and it scales beautifully uh, to all of our clients. And it enables us to have index optimization for search uh, because we're using just one numeric number for any region that a client is viewing. Um, if you want to know more, uh, there's a link on, ge on, on, on geohashing, but I, I guess you'll be able to you know, just, just Google it. Um, however, even with geohashing, um, we felt that we can do better. I think we can do better because uh, Firestore is limited to about 1 million direct connections. So this is maybe premature optimization, but at some point we'll have a million users. Why not? Um, so let's take that one step further. And as we'll have more users, there will be more vehicles equals more data that needs to be synchronized, and that is affecting our pocket. So we need to think about costs. Um, the second one, I, I won't go into detail because there's actually quite a complex thing behind it, but feel free to find me after the presentation. I can explain to you why doing multiple geohash queries uh, is a complicated thing. Um, but we, we started thinking, like, what, what can we do? What's the next step? Um, and, and, and the third part of this, this kind of problem is it obviously de degrades user experience. As you start scaling, things will start slowing down, and, and then it's pretty much like, okay, now we're too late. And by the time you start refactoring, um, there is already you know, damage done and, and, and people switching to another uh, competitor. So our approach here was... Um, to tackle these three big problems is start building uh, the dot API, where initially the clients were directly connecting to the Firestore through the SDK, uh, which brings tons of benefits. We want to work on becoming transportation as a service. We want to be available to everyone. We want the partners uh, of the future want to have the same experience as we do. So that basically means that there is no difference between building an application for ourselves as well as making all of the data and services available to everyone else. Um, so in order to tackle some of these challenges, um, we've implemented a facade, which is a Redis system, which keeps the uh, entire state of the world in, in memory. Sorry, am I... Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to finish up, yeah. Um, which keeps the entire state of uh, the world in memory. Uh, and this has brought a cost reduction of 98.5% to our, our bill on Firestore because of the caching of uh, all of these uh, reads, uh, read requests. Um, we also optimized the data transmission layer to switching to uh, protobuf. Why? 
there is no need for all of the additional data, like the parameters, saying this is the parameter and this is the value. We already know what the other side is expecting, so switching to product above compressed the data a lot more. And most importantly, we decided to leverage the um, uh, gRPC uh, as a bidirectional uh, streaming. Why? User experience. Um, gRPC, for those who don't know it, uh, it's a very efficient way of communicating between clients and, and services. And it's a bidirectional stream. This means that when you open up the application, it opens up a stream and vehicles become available on the map as the data changes in our system. So it will always be up to date. It will not bombard you with you know, a loading screen and then suddenly you see a million scooters. They'll pop up on your screen as they become available and disappear as well. Um, this setup enables us to become the transportation as a service provider for the future for everyone, where we're incorporating um, not only our own vehicles, but buses, trains, and whatever transportation means will be available in the near future. Now, obviously, we, you know, we want to build this with uh, talented people, so we are hiring. <laughs> and luckily, we have our head of uh, recruitment here with us as well, Alan. Um, but we have a number of teams, so we'll continue scaling those teams. Uh, teams like the writer team, responsible for writer application, anything consumer facing. So each team is fully stacked. They have iOS engineers, backend engineers. Um, we have our operation teams, which is focused on internal products and ensuring that each of the regions can operate autonomously. We have our embedded and firmware engineers, primarily in C, for the ones who are very interested in it. Um, and in terms of hiring process, um, please submit your, um, your resume. Uh, we'll do a code assignment, code review. You'll be invited for a team on-site interview as well to meet the team. Um, and the internship uh, for us is a four to six month, uh, six months internship. Um, so if you want to know more, jobs at lever.com slash dot co slash dot or recruiting at ride.com. So thank you for uh, listening, uh, and I'm more than happy to, uh, to hear your questions. Uh, to start off with, we have a question from the web, uh, from Moana. Why did you choose for an e-scooter as an environment-friendly solution? Uh, she says, in Berlin, for example, there is a similar service offered by the company Lime, and a study found that the e-scooters are typically used for distances between one and two kilometers, which wouldn't replace a car ride, but rather a walk. I can take that question. Uh, so to answer the, this person in Berlin, uh, so the average distance uh, for our trips is about 3.4 kilometers, uh, which means uh, that we are not replacing uh, uh, walking. Uh, walking typically would be a distance between uh, up to one kilometer. So I would say 80% or 90% of the trips replace either car, either public transportation, or uh, you know whatever, Vespa or motorbikes. Uh, that's, uh, that's uh, probably the answer. She has something to add, and there's also being left everywhere in the streets, clogging the pathways, breaking mm -hmm. quite quickly, and producing a lot of waste. Do you yeah. have a solution for this? Yeah, so there are two aspects to that. One is uh, waste. Uh, I think it's a question about the durability of the, the hardware. And then there's the question, where do we park them, right? And so historically, in shared mobility, at the beginning, it was dock-based. So you, you, know, you go to Paris, you go to, to many cities, you had some stations. And, and you had to get the bike there, and it, it was a quite complicated process, actually, to get the bike. And then you had to bring it back to one of these stations. The prime is that it was not flexi very flexible for users, because there were only so many stations, and if the station is already full, you can't put your bike back, or if it's empty, uh, you have the same problem. So then, uh, and that was a Chinese uh, invention, uh, it, it went, uh, thanks to IoT uh, technology, it went to free-floating. And free floating is great because basically you don't have the dock uh, station limitation. You can pick it anywhere and you can bring it anywhere at the door of where you are going. The problem with that is that it, it can create a mess, especially where cities there is not much space. It, you know, people leave it not necessarily in the best location. So where we are moving is what we call semi-free floating. And thanks actually to the work that the, the software engineering team is doing, is that what we are doing is we are creating 
virtual parking locations. And so instead of having just, you know, like, let's say, uh, uh, you know, 200 uh, stations and, and, you know, having to invest in the, with the city in the, the hardware of the station, what you create, uh, if, if we take the, the case of the city of Paris, we are creating 2,500 virtual parking locations and leveraging a GPS technology and also other technologies for accuracy reasons, we are able aggressively to enforce, to make sure that people only pick the e-scooter in this parking location and bring it back to this parking location. I mean, you know, we still put actually in collaboration with the city some painting on the, on the, the street so that people know exactly where it is. But basically, it, it costs nothing to do it except replacing a car park but it increases a lot of the flexibility for users. So that's where we are going. And, uh, you know, we are not in Berlin, so our competitors obviously are not doing uh, such a great job as what we are doing. But when we go to Berlin, obviously, we'll be happy to, uh, to use this, uh, this great technology. Yeah. Thank you. Are there questions in the room? Okay, I will. So as far as I understand, your headquarters is in Amsterdam. Mm. But according to the map you, you showed, like your e-scooters are literally everywhere but Amsterdam. Yeah. How so? Uh, it's because of regulatory limitations. So uh, till recently, the e-scooters first were not allowed uh, on the Dutch uh, streets. Uh, so we could not operate. And then, uh, then they passed a, a new law, uh, but the product requirements were such that no e-scooter on the market today could qualify for, uh, to pass basically the, the homologation uh, process. So we are developing actually right now, uh, we are fairly advanced on a new e-scooter that will have the features uh, required by the Dutch regulation. And once it's homologated, we'll be able to operate in, uh, in the Netherlands. Mm. All right, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for um, getting into this tricky market because we need solutions like yours. Yeah. And thinking a little bit uh, about the future, um, some say that the batteries that are re required for those vehicles are gonna yeah. run out, like we're gonna run out of material. So I thought, if you think about that, yeah. and another thing is, have you thought of making um, a system that would recommend a path through the city that is designed for this kind of mobility and optimizing a bit of walking and parking and so on? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, the, um, so for the, the battery and the environmental impact first. So, so first, I, I think we, there are two aspects. One is the carbon emissions, because even our activity is not carbon free. And so, you know, we have actually studied uh, in detail uh, what's the carbon impact of what we are doing. Uh, and so, for instance, I can tell you that 50% is the manufacturing of the, the e-scooters themselves. So that's why designing e-scooters and making sure you maintain them so that they last as long as possible is critical to reduce overall the, the carbon footprint. Uh, but it, when it comes to battery, I agree. There, it's not yet a perfect solution. Uh, you know, we, we work a lot on how to recycle these batteries once they, they come uh, to the end of their life. So for instance, we are collaborating with a company that reuse uh, batteries that are less performing after a while to stock energy for personal houses. So imagine you have a house with uh, solar panels. You need to store energy so that you can use it after, but you don't need highly performing batteries for that. So what they do is they recycle basically the batteries to give them a second life after they are used for vehicles that require high performance battery. But Honestly, I think that batteries is not like, or at least the current technology of batteries is not the best solution. So we are all looking for new innovation and new things that will come out. Maybe we are agnostic, you know, so maybe in the future it will be hydrogen. Maybe it will be something else, you know. But I agree with you, like batteries, I think it's better than, than fuel-based cars today, you know, but, but it's not like the, the final solution. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like optimizing the, the transportation, I think we are, we are not yet uh, there, I think, but our ultimate uh, goal is to be integrated with public transportation. We are already working on that to offer basically uh, mobility as a service. And so at this point, we'll work also on optimizing the, 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 you know, the, what's the optimal way to move around in the city. You have uh, anything else to add? Uh, no, that's pretty much correct. Mm. 
I have a follow-up of the question before. Yeah. Uh, Elias asks, what guarantees that a user will return the e-scooters to the so-called virtual docks? Yeah, uh, so, you know, we have to sanction. So, <laughs> so what we do is uh, we, we uh, so first we, we inform exactly where are all the parking location on our app. Um, and, and there are a lot. I mean, like, basically, in a city like Paris, you have always a parking location within about 100 meters. So it's not, like, you know, super... Uh, impactful for, for the user experience. And then if people don't park, uh, basically we, we, we have a penalty system. So meaning that they will have to pay maybe five euro. Uh, you know, we are still thinking what's the optimal. <laughs> we don't want to be overly, uh, you know, uh, too, 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 too severe. But in the same time, we have to enforce it. Otherwise, nobody will do it. Uh, and then if people still insist to do it, they say, well, I don't give a shit. I, I will put, uh, you know, my e-scooter and pay the five or ten euro penalty. Then we send, we get an alert. And we have people on the ground with cargo e back and so on. And they will pick, basically, the e-scooter and relocate it. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Um, so bike sharing services have been around for a while, like 10, 13 years ago. You already had, like, Vélib in Paris and Bixi in Montreal. So I was just wondering if you could say, how has the sort of market landscape changed since then? And how have your companies such as yours adapted to these changes? Because you've already mentioned, for example, docking versus uh, free, was it loading? Free yeah. floating. Free floating, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I think the key is IoT technology, right? Uh, so IoT technology, so embedded software on uh, uh, vehicles, have created intelligent vehicles. So meaning that our e-scooters, they might seem basic if you see a picture, but in reality, there's a lot of technology inside us. So we know exactly where they're located. Uh, the, if there is a problem with the motor, the brakes, or anything, they send us a signal so that we can block immediately the vehicle and send some guys to do the maintenance uh, and all these things, right? And this makes it possible, basically, to have a much more flexible approach, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, the the... the the, the, the free floating or semi free floating model, which you know, and and uh, and Velib, you know, you could say it's successful, it was one of the first programs uh, on it, but the reality is still very few people use it, and it's because of all the limitations we are related to the station. And we believe that by making it a lot more flexible, you can actually adjust a lot more to the demand in terms of where the, the vehicles are located. Also, you can adjust to the, each day of the week uh, to the hour. And so we develop also, we didn't talk about it, but a lot of algorithm so that we can optimize the fleet uh, location according to the demand. So, so I think that, that's one of the direction. And the second is the integration between different forms of mobility, which is uh, still at the beginning, but will happen in the coming years. Thank you. We have time for one more question from the audience and one more question online. Uh, I'll start with a question online. Uh, Pamela asks, how do you deal with the safety of the user, not the data, but the body? Here in Brazil, legislators want the user, Lime and Yellow, similar companies, to use the helmets. Mm. So the helmet. <laughs> 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 so obviously, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's hard to... I mean, actually, we, funny enough, we, are, we have studied, uh, we've done a, a research and development partnership with a company to integrate the, the helmet uh, on our e-scooter, even though it's small, and, and it's possible. Uh, but I think, honestly, the, the safety overall of the e-scooters comes from two uh, main areas. Uh, the first one is infrastructures, which is controlled by the city. And the second is the, the, the hardware itself. So uh, you know, is it safe to use an e-scooter or not? And so on the, the infrastructure, you know, the key uh, e-scooters, you have to know, the, generally speaking, they are limited to 20 kilometers per hour or 25 kilometers per hour. So it doesn't go faster than a bike. Huh? So if you have, like in Amsterdam, uh, you know, cycling lanes that are well isolate, insula, isolated from cars, there is very, the risk, uh, actually, for the user is very small. Right? It's not more, it's the same, actually, it has been proven than, than uh, for a bike. Huh? But obviously, if you mix uh, e-scooters or even bikes with cars, it becomes dangerous. Where does the danger come from? Well, from the cars, you know. <laughs> when there are big accidents, it's not the, between two e-scooters, one a bike and one e-scooter. No, it's because of a car. So that's the key thing from an infrastructure perspective is isolate the cars from the small mobility, so e-scooters, bikes, etc. 
So that's why uh, that's what we work on also with, with cities. From a hardware perspective, what we have to uh, provide is first like um, e-scooters that are reliable when it comes to brakes. You know, it has to brake. It, it sounds easy, but actually you have to guarantee it, you have to maintain, you have to control, you know, you have to do all these things. You cannot just throw a, an e-scooter and hope that in two months, you know, the brakes will still be working in need as an operator. That's your responsibility to make sure it keeps working. And, and then there's the whole design, you know, big wheels, large deck, making sure it's stable, and, and you know, all these things that are associated. The third thing is a bit of user education also. You know, you don't want to go... Uh, them to go on this, uh, the, the sidewalk and, you know, to do a, you know, stupid things. So we, we spend a lot of time also, like, trying to, to, to uh, educate the users and tell them what's the, the, the right way of using it. The helmet, sorry, I didn't know, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the helmet. So my point of view, you know, and it's debatable, uh, but that's my point of view, is that I don't think it's a good idea to enforce uh, the use of helmets for e-scooters, the same as for bikes. And the reason is the same as for bikes is that, if you want to encourage micromobility, you know, I, I think you have to, you, if, you, if you make it compulsory to use a helmet, I think you discourage basically people to use bikes or e-scooters because they don't always have a helmet uh, with them. And I think the main thing to protect users is really, again, good infrastructures. If you have good infrastructures, you protect users from, uh, from, from cars, and, and that's how you, you know, mainly you solve the problem. Okay, do you have one final question? Yes. The catch box. So let's say I'm a student. <laughs> I know I look young enough, so just bear with me. Um, so, and I have an offer from a Facebook or a Google, right, to do an internship. Or I have an offer from Dot. Why should I pick Dot versus these, uh, <laughs> these larger companies? Um, I wouldn't say... Having an offer from Facebook or Google is a bad thing. Um, <laughs> it's acceptable. I, I, I mean, <laughs> if there is an offer, that's great opportunities. There's definitely tons of things that you can learn. Um, what I would look for or, or why DOT is definitely a good choice is at our current stage, we're much smaller and we iterate much faster. We fail much faster. And if your ambition is to learn as much as you can within those six months, I think you'll learn more at DOT than coming into Facebook or Google. Yeah. Thank you very much. If you want to keep the conversation going, there's drinks at Canteen, Dayful Pass, other tickets, and please, one more round of applause for our speakers today. Thank you.